Hey, you want to learn about electricity? Have you ever wondered how the electricity that's used all over the world is generated? Well, there are many different forms of power generation being used, including the burning of fossil fuels, nuclear power, and renewable energy sources. Today, most of our electricity is being generated by fossil fuels, primarily coal and natural gas, to spin turbines that are connected to an electromagnetic generator. But this is changing as renewables and natural gas are becoming more cost effective. Utilities produce this energy inside of large power plants, also known as generation stations. Let's start with the question, what is a generator and how does it work? A generator, like the one behind me, is a mechanical device that converts mechanical power into electrical power, or electricity, by electromagnetic induction, which is done by spinning a magnetic field within a coil of wire. This phenomenon is explained by Faraday's law, as shown here in this example. As the magnet travels back and forth through inside the loop of wire, it induces a current in that wire. Since the field is continuously changing or alternating, it creates what we would call a sine wave or alternating current waveform. This is where the term AC power comes from, which stands for alternating current. How does a generator work? The two main parts of a generator are the rotor and the stator. The rotor is the part that rotates and consists of many loops of copper wire or bars called field windings. Field windings are used to create the magnetic field induced on the metal core to which the wire is wrapped around. The stator is the stationary or static part of the generator that consists of copper windings called armature windings. The power that is produced by the generator will flow out of these armature windings towards the load. Historically, the first generator invented was a direct current or DC generator called dynamo. DC power produced by these generators was limited because the generation source had to be close to the loads. Then came alternating current produced by AC generators called an alternator or a synchronous generator. A key advantage of an AC generator is that it works with a device called a transformer, which can both increase and decrease voltage by thousands of volts. This allows the power to be transmitted over long distance transmission lines. This is the reason why AC generators power the bulk of the world's electricity grid today. If DC power generators supplied the electric grid, there would have to be significantly more power stations because each station can only supply a limited area, unlike the large centralized generation stations in existence today that supply large areas or entire cities. My name is Osato Iden. Uh, I grew up in uh, New York City in the Bronx. Uh, in 2009, I moved to Houston, Texas. All right, that's the question. I, I don't want to give the cliche answer, just, you know, good with my hands. But um, yeah, generally, I've just, you know, always been, been good with my hands, always uh, tinkering around with stuff. Uh, I work on my own car. So in high school, I was actually heavily um, influenced by music. I never thought that I would be going into a science degree at all. And then I just threw myself into physics courses, English courses, and a whole bunch of different things that I didn't really know a lot about. And I just wanted to learn more and see if maybe one of those things caught my attention and that I started liking more. So if you do have a hobby, that's great, but make sure that you're not just closing yourself off to just the things you like. Be willing to like explore things outside of your comfort zone. Well, actually, uh, in, when I left high school and uh, got into college, I was actually trying to study kinesiology. Um, but uh, I had some, you know, parental influences that <laughs> wanted me to do something else, uh, especially with, you know, being Nigerian and, you know, in our culture, they want certain career paths, engineer, lawyer, doctor, stuff like that. Um, so I actually, um, I did a year of college and then I joined the military. I was in the Air Force Reserve and I was working on uh, jet engines in uh, San Antonio, Texas at Lackland Air Force Base. And, um, 
that kind of, I guess, gave me a little push towards moving, you know, working more with my hands and, um, uh, you know, towards the engineering side of things. Um, and then when I um, went back to school, I started studying um, mechanical engineering. The electric power grid is a network of pieces that combine to process and distribute electrical power. For electricity to be delivered to your home or business, it goes through three main parts known as generation, transmission, and distribution. Electricity production begins with generation. There are many different types of power plants that use a variety of energy sources and technologies to generate electricity. Some of the more common power plants are nuclear facilities, solar, or maybe even wind farms like behind me, hydroelectric power plants, or diesel or coal-fired and natural gas power plants. Renewables are making a large impact with power production in the world and accounting for about a third of the world's generation. The most significant are wind, solar, and hydro. Hydropower or hydroelectricity is by far the largest form of renewable energy and produces about 24% of the world's electricity. In the United States, there are more than 2,000 hydropower plants in operation and account for around 7% of the total energy. The most well-known hydropower plant in the United States is the Hoover Dam, and it has a total of 17 generators, each able to generate up to 133 megawatts with a total capacity of 2,074 megawatts. The power plant with the largest available capacity in the world is the Three Gorges Dam in China, which utilizes 32 turbines, each with a capacity of 700 megawatts and two additional 50 megawatt turbines. That's an overall capacity of 22,500 megawatts. To put that in perspective, that is more than double the amount being produced by the largest nuclear power plant in the world, which is almost 7,500 megawatts. Hydroelectric plants generate electricity like fossil fuels and nuclear power plants, but spin a turbine using the force of water instead of steam. A hydro plant uses the pressure of water created by either a difference of elevation for dams or the force of water in rivers. In either case, the head pressure can be regulated by a control gate, so when the water flows down a controlled pipeline called a penstock, the pressure builds up, spinning a turbine at the bottom and turns the rotor of an AC generator. Wind power is the next highest producing renewable behind hydropower at 6% of the United States total generation. Wind generation is continuing to rise as more of an effort goes into the production of renewable energy. Wind generation relies on the spinning of a wind turbine that turns the rotor of a generator. This type of generation can be done for individual homes all the way up to utility scale applications that are generally many units connected together as a wind farm. Typically, utility scale windmills in the United States produce about 1500 kilowatts each and have blades that are about 80 feet long. Our current wind power capacity in the U.S. is around 82,000 megawatts, second only to China and the European Union. The U.S. Department of Energy, or DOE, projects the U.S. to have 404,000 megawatts of peak wind power capacity by 2050. That will be enough to fulfill one-third of the power demand with all turbines at peak output if future projections are accurate. Solar power has been on a steady rise as it becomes more available and a good economic investment. There are lots of incentives in place to promote the growth of solar generation for your home or business. Solar generation is a totally different type of generation compared to all the others mentioned so far. There is no prime mover or AC generator with solar panels. Solar panels strictly rely on the solar radiation from the sun to be absorbed by photovoltaic panels to produce DC power. The DC power is then converted into AC by the use of power electronics inside an inverter. 36% of all new electricity generating capacity additions this past year are actually from solar power. Solar power has been holding quite steady since 2013 by being about 30% of all added electric power capacity in the United States year over year. Our current solar capacity is 69,000 megawatts, which is on track to double by 2024 adding over 15,000 megawatts each year. Here at the Power Systems Experience Center, we have a small wind turbine and several different solar installations to illustrate how these alternative energy solutions are viable and can be connected to your grid or microgrid. After electricity is generated from a power plant, next is transmission, as shown behind me. 
You may commonly see these lines along the highway or in more rural areas. Transmission is known as the interstate highway of electricity delivery, which moves large, large amounts of power at very high voltages, up to 1 million volts. It goes from the generation stations over long distances to substations closer to areas of demand for electricity where it is distributed. You may notice distribution lines connected to your house or in your neighborhood. And if transmission is the interstate highway of the grid, then distribution is considered the city street. Distribution is the last leg of delivery of electrical power from generation to consumer in order to deliver the bulk power moving from the transmission system to your home or business. The bulk power must be reduced to lower voltage levels by electricity distributors before it can be delivered to a residence or business and to your 120 volt outlets. This is done on either a pole mounted transformer like this or a pad mounted transformer outside of a building or house like these. The distribution process is the last leg of the delivery of electrical power from generation to the consumer in order to deliver this bulk of power to your home and to your 120 volt outlets. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I have a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering with an emphasis in Renewable Energies and a minor in Mathematics. I wanted to pursue electrical engineering. Um, it was kind of a process of elimination. So I started as undeclared engineering because I knew that I liked physics and I liked math, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that. So I figured engineering was something that implemented both of those things into something that would be able to help people. So then I explored some different engineering careers, such as environmental engineering. I learned that I didn't like that. And I figured, you know, what else do people need besides water and food in their daily lives? And I was like, power, electricity is something that people need in our modern culture. So I wanted to work with providing that. So my current role at Eaton is power systems engineer. I am just starting that position. And uh, sorry, what was the other part of the question? Oh, how did you go from, uh, say, undergrad to engineering? Okay. I found this position with the Society of Women Engineers, actually. I was really involved with that group throughout, high, throughout college and a little bit in high school. So, you know, in engineering, it was very common to find a class full of um, male students and you'd be the only woman in that classroom. So that was very intimidating. And the Society of Women Engineers made me feel welcome into this career, into this environment that, yeah, women can be involved in STEM and engineering careers um, just as well as men. Ooh, it's actually a funny story because uh, I, didn't know about Eden uh, when I was in college before you know meeting the recruiter. Uh, I was at a career fair and I was you know walking around talking to different companies and you know usually I like to take breaks after maybe 10 companies or so. Um, and I was just outside the rec center and a man came down and sat next to me and we started talking and um, he invited me over to his booth and you know he, he really, I guess, liked me, and so he wanted me to, you know, he put me down for an interview, and long story short, here I am. The power generation industry encompasses a variety of products and services, including electricity, natural gas, oil, and renewable energy technology. Some career paths in this field may target an engineering or business background, but many opportunities exist that target a wider scope of marketable skills, experience, and training, and can have great pay potential. Some jobs may include construction of power plants, which can consist of construction managers, equipment operators, or welders, or operation of power plants, which can consist of power operators, electricians, electrical installers and repair, or electrical engineers or energy services like Duquesne Light, which can consist of field technicians, electricians, electrical engineers, electrical installers and repair, or linemen, who are the ones who set up and repair power lines 
So make sure you're not afraid of heights if you're thinking of this job. Or energy resources like fossil fuels, natural gas, and renewables, which can consist of solar installation, wind turbines service technicians, or installation and maintenance. Um, so for me, something exciting about power systems engineering in particular is that it is power systems engineering is something that affects people's everyday lives. Like whether you realize it or not, whether you have an engineering degree or just a technical degree, um, you can still affect people's lives directly with the job that you do just by providing maintenance or design or whatever it is that work that you're doing related to a power system. You're going to end up helping someone on their daily lives, which is a pretty cool thing that not a lot of people can say that their job does that. And we get paid pretty well because our job is so important. How do you like Eaton and the power industry so far? Do you see it as like a promising career path? I do, uh, not only because of uh, just the scope of the work, but also because of I guess testimonials, I hear so many people saying that, you know, they're going to be lifers or this is the last company that, you know, they'll work for. So uh, that's, you know, definitely something that's reassuring to hear. I've got my field officer dance and stuff. Right. <laughs> I'm Amber Wright and I'm an engineering manager for major projects at Eaton. And today, you know, I really want to talk about where I got to um, my current position and, and really what's important to me during that process. And so, when you look at opportunities that I had in college, they included internships, co-ops, um, you know, sort of ride along type experiences. And I challenge you to do the same thing, but don't wait till college, do it now. If you have an interest, follow that interest. Go look for a program that gives you that exposure today, paid or unpaid. Uh, it's all about the opportunity. So capitalize on any opportunity you can capture to get that experience. You might find out that it's something you wanna pursue as a career. Um, otherwise, it'll help you kind of filter those things out. But STEM itself is more than just, you know, learning to problem solve. It's also about being on the, the cutting edge of technology and, and giving you a differentiation amongst your peers on, on what you can contribute to society. So, you know, consider STEM in the form of really uh, empowering yourself to, to not only have stability and opportunity, but also to, to uh, enhance society with, with tools and technologies that very few people understand. And so, as, as I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with electrical engineering, I went straight into what we call a leadership development program. It allowed me to uh, learn different types of roles within an organization, as well as uh, capitalize on, on gaining leadership skills and, and business uh, understanding, and uh, also moving around a little bit. I uh, went from Pittsburgh to North Carolina to Houston. I spent five years in Houston running a, a facility very similar to the uh, what we call Experience Center in Pittsburgh, where I, I taught thousands of people a year how power works. And then it also allowed me to uh, really get to know the community around me and contribute to greater causes. It's a big deal. Be a part of the society that you live in and, and bring value to that society, not only for yourself, but be an example for those behind you. And today, I'm an engineering manager for a team of eight engineers, which is, is pretty impressive because these people are, are really responsible for over a, a billion dollars in revenue for the company that I work for. And, and that's highly impressive because that skill set is so unique. So, you know, my big takeaway here today is, is be something and, and be part of something bigger, not only for yourself, but the people around you. So, you know, my biggest ask is that you challenge yourself today, you reach a little bit farther, because you won't always have a, a mentor that looks just like you. You're, you're gonna have to get creative in who you believe in, vet that person out, but really understand that there are people around you here to help and here to support. And I'll be one of those people that's always gonna cheer you on and help you feel empowered. So all I ask today is that you, you be extraordinary. You be a little bit more than what you think you can do and you, you keep pushing to challenge yourself. And don't wait to start, start today. Um, something that motivated me was seeing other women in my career excel, um, not even just electrical engineering, but other fields of science and engineering. And just making sure that if my professor said something like, oh, you didn't do well in this, I'd always be like, okay, like, what can I do? What can I change to do better next time around? Or what are some better things to do to prepare myself in the future if this situation were to happen again?
So uh, being in this field now, kind of set up, established, what would you tell your younger self, say in high school, to motivate you to continue uh, to strive on and also to interest you to continue to get mm. into What would I tell my younger self? Um, I would tell my younger self that, you know, as, as long as you, you put your mind to something, there's, there's pretty much nothing you can't do. Um, I, I would say the biggest thing is, is to keep pushing and don't quit. You know, you will fail. I have failed, um, you know, plenty of times. Uh, but as long as you, you know, you keep your, your eyes on the, on the prize and you keep pushing towards your goals, you'll, you'll make it there. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, that was